We human beings reckon to be in charge of our fellow animals. We use them for food, for companionship, to guard our houses, but for every animal we choose to have round our homes, how many unseen and uninvited guests? Round this Wiltshire cottage live four sorts of mice. Take just one of them, the wood mouse. Even in these overcrowded islands, there are more wood mice than human beings. We don't often see mice, but their lives are closely linked with ours. The special habitats they need are often custom-built by man. Coppicing, an ancient rotational method of cropping hazel and sweet chestnut trees, provides man with fencing, jumps for his horses and spars for his thatched roof. But it also provides the ideal habitat for the dozing mouse, the seven sleeper, in other words, the dormouse. Not a true mouse, in fact, but a close relative of the mouse family. The dormouse needs to live on the woodland edge and coppicing constantly renews just the conditions it needs for feeding, breeding and hibernating. Coppiced woodlands are becoming scarce, but the ideal home for another species of mouse is easy to find. Yeah, wasn't that a lovely track? That was Peggy Lee in All Right, OK, You Win. The house mouse seems at home in a man-made hole in the skirting board, but its ancestors evolved on the steppes of Central Asia from which it hitched a lift with man. It's now probably the most widely distributed of mammals, found almost all over the world. House mice now thrive in the concrete labyrinths of high-rise flats, in the depths of coal mines, and in coal stores where the temperatures kept well below freezing. Here in Britain, some house mice share human habitats all the year round. Others move in from the countryside with the onset of winter. House-living house mice breed throughout the year. Straw, paper, even electrical insulation form the nest. If a pair bred at the start of the year and their young survived and bred and so on, by New Year's Eve, there'd be a grand total of 2,500 mice. Early spring, in gardens and woods, though sometimes in houses too, lives a close relative of the house mouse, the wood mouse. From April onwards, there'll be wood mouse litters in the underground nest. These tiny blind young weigh only one to two grams at birth, but they grow rapidly. They'll be weaned in two and a half weeks, by which time the mother will usually be pregnant again. The mouse's eye view is very different from ours. Its vision is poor, it can do little more than distinguish shape and movement. Its picture of the world is built up of tastes and smells and sounds. So, as it moves out into unknown territory, it's building up a sensory mouse map in its mind, starting typically by skirting the wall of the room. In emergency, it can then head instantly for home. Even food must be thoroughly inspected before starting to eat. The new arrivals check carefully too. They're encouraged by recognising the smell of another family member. A house mouse needs a fifth of its body weight in food each day and remarkably hardly any extra liquid. In houses, although it shows preferences, it will eat just about everything human beings eat as well as odd items like soap and candles. We have a number of misconceptions about mice, and here comes one of them. A kitten, according to a 10th century law, was valued at a penny. But once a cat was a proven mouser, it was worth as much as fourpence. Sadly, the truth is that even a proper fourpenny cat is not particularly efficient at clearing the house of mice, though many mice are pretty good at getting out of the way.
The first young wood mice of the year are ready to leave the nest. The house mice have been active all winter, but for the reawakening dormouse, the year is just beginning. For five months, it survived the hazards of being eaten, starved, or frozen to death. But there's a further ordeal to come. During hibernation, the dormouse's whole metabolism slows down. Its respiration and heart rate fall, its temperature drops, even the composition of its blood is altered. The return to normal takes up to 12 hours and imposes a great strain on the animal. Altogether, from one cause or another, up to 80% of dormice are thought to die during hibernation. Having safely emerged, the dormouse has no time to lose. During hibernation, it has lost half its body weight, and now it has to feed up rapidly on buds, grass seeds and green shoots before the real business of the year can begin. Over on the far side of the cottage is another habitat, man-made for man, but also for mouse. Our smallest rodent, the harvest mouse. It's specially adapted to life among the corn stalks. The tip of the tail grips tightly on grasses. It also serves as a brake. Its skeleton is light, only 5% of the body weight. It has an excellent sense of balance and uncanny skill in judging if a corn stalk can bear its weight. Unlike other mice, the harvest mouse is active by day and by night, so it's vulnerable to two lots of predators. But by far its worst enemy is modern farming. Man creates its home, but also destroys it. Early summer, and in the hazel coppice, the dormouse has built itself another nest. Whereas the hibernation nest is at or below ground level, the breeding nest is usually about a metre up, in the fork of a sapling or a bramble. It's a large, rather untidy structure, often made of honeysuckle bark and dry grass. The dormouse weaves the nest right round herself, then lines it with finely shredded material ready for the birth of her litter. Butterflies are on the wing, summer is at its height. In her carefully constructed nest, the dormouse prepares to give birth. This scrap of life, blind and naked, weighs only three grams. It looks almost like a premature birth. 
As each baby is born, the mother picks it up and cleans it thoroughly. She finally produces the last of her four young, an average litter, and severs the umbilical cord. The eyes of the babies don't open until they're 18 days old. In the early stages, they just have folds of skin where their ears will be, and the toes are all stuck together. But even at this age, they already show signs of the whiskers, which will be so important to them in later life. Back at the cottage, living is easier. The house mice move out to the gardens and sheds. Their move doesn't go unnoticed. The dormouse's breeding nest needs to be well concealed. The young dormice remain in it for a month, far longer than the other species. The much smaller harvest mice, for example, will be independent in half that time and may have been driven from the nest area by their mother. Once their eyes are open, they become much more active and boisterous and push their mother around the nest as they attempt to suckle. The wheat is ripe. The harvest mouse world is destroyed. Adults can flee from the advancing combine, but young, still in the nest, have no escape. Mice who live with man share his harvest, share his protection. They make their nests in sites which wouldn't exist if they weren't deliberately created, in the coppice, the house, the harvest field. They have many advantages. But there are hazards too. What man makes, man destroys, perhaps wiping out a whole population of mice as he does so. However, even a relatively independent life doesn't free mice from sudden danger. In their network of runways under the tree stump, the wood mice are building up a good supply of nuts for the coming winter. Although they're less active during the cold weather, they don't hibernate like the dormouse, so they need to stock up the larder. And they're liable to be visited by a much fiercer and more successful predator than the cat. One of its country names is Mouse Hunt. In other words, the stoat. Meanwhile, the cornfield has been ploughed up. The surviving harvest mice take refuge in hedgerows and gardens. They can continue to breed till November, weather permitting, but in a wet autumn, up to 80% of the young will die. Harvest mice are so small that it's hard for them to maintain body heat. The surviving young are easily recognised. Their coats are greyish-brown, unlike the russet coat of the adults. 
With luck, they'll overwinter and produce the first new generation next spring. The young dormice, too, have greyer coats than their sandy brown mother. At four weeks old, they're starting to make their first excursions from the nest. As a rule, dormice are only active at night. Their large eyes and long whiskers help them to find their way through the branches without the aid of light. But young dormice not uncommonly emerge before it's dark. This youngster already has a good sense of balance, though perhaps its movements are more jerky than an adult's. Dormice are well suited to life in the trees. Both front and back feet are adapted to grasping twigs and have small pads to help them keep a firm grip. The distinctive bushy tail. The dormouse is our only small mammal to have one. It isn't used for grasping, but for balancing. Brambles are very important to dormice. The hazel and the bramble together are the two most crucial components of dormouse habitat, providing food, cover and nest sites and they're ideally combined in a hazel coppice like this. Sadly, the habitat that's so popular with dormice is no longer popular with man. The fences, the thatching spars are not much in demand today, and as a result, dormice are far less common than they were a century ago. As autumn approaches, the dormouse settles down to eating in real earnest. Nuts are very important to it. They contain a large amount of protein and fat, enabling the dormouse to double its body weight with a reserve of food for the coming winter. If the nut is not very ripe, it will be eaten on the twig. But dormice usually prefer to carry it off to a chosen perch. They'll often devote five minutes or more to a single nut. Dormice have a special technique for dealing with a nut. Holding it in their front paws, they gradually turn the nut round, cutting through the shell with their lower teeth. They then remove the kernel bit by bit, perhaps with the help of the tongue. The neatly opened nut, with its smoothly chiselled edge, is a real Dormouse trademark. But finally, the eating has to stop. The dormouse will once more roll up into a ball, curl its tail over its face and retire for the winter. As winter closes in, the house becomes an island of warmth and comfort and the uninvited guests flock back to take advantage of it and the many facilities that human beings provide. There are many cheddars on the market, but only one original. So what makes this the family favourite? It's the gorgeous flavour, full of country freshness and goodness, that our home-produced cheddar has. So when you're buying cheddar, be choosy. English, a better bit of cheddar. Yes, of all the mice that live with us, House mice are the champion opportunists. Their huge success as animals, their spread throughout the world, are the direct result of making use of the conditions provided by man, following him wherever he goes. When, I wonder, shall we see the first mouse on the moon?